For a console so packed with sublime platform games, the debate often comes up as to what title is ultimately the best on the console. Despite being one of the first games for the system, Super Mario 64 is often hailed as a benchmark which all N64 platform games aspire to surpass. For quite some time that remained the case until Rare's Banjo-Kazooie arrived on the scene. With incredible visuals, that rare charm and tight controls and gameplay, in my opinion that game became the new benchmark for developers to aspire to. Not being one to rest on their laurels, and to the surprise of nobody, work quickly began on the follow-up title named Banjo-Kazooie 2 in 1998. With so many ideas and features having been cut from the original title due to time, budget and technical constraints, the team were keen to implement as many as possible in the follow-up. With the N64 disk drive still expected to be on the horizon, the studio were planning for the game to take full advantage of Nintendo's newest add-on to create one of the most ambitious games on the system. We all know how that turned out, and so instead Banjo-Tooie became one of the few cancelled N64 DD games to get a port to the regular console that we all know and love. Developed by Rare and published by Nintendo in the year 2000 in North America and Japan, leaving Europe to wait until April the following year, Banjo-Tooie, as the name suggests, is a direct sequel to Rare's earlier Smash hit. Taking place two years after the events of the first game, the story finds our lovable bear and bird combo enjoying a game of cards with their friends. With the evil witch Gruntilda seemingly trapped forever, life has been easy on Spiral Mountain. Gruntilda's ever-present lackey Klongo continues his struggle to free Gruntilda's rotting corpse which is trapped underground by a huge boulder. This sparks the arrival of old Grunty's horrible sisters Mingella and Blobelda who bring with them the Hag-1, a huge drilling machine capable of finally freeing the bones of their long-lost sister. For whatever reason, they instead decide to use their magic spells to smash the boulder, which sends shockwaves throughout the world. With the boulder finally out of the way, Gruntilda is back in business, although now she's been reduced to nothing but crusty old bones. Her sisters do promise to restore her full body. Mumbo has witnessed all of this, and he makes a dash back to tell the others. Unfortunately though, his freakish looks catch the attention of the villains. They send a horrible spell to smash Banjo's house, whilst they do make an escape. But Bottles is sadly toasted and is turned into nothing more than a ghostly apparition. With Bottles being a ghost in the game, the studio originally had a great idea to be an additional mode where the second player could use Bottles' ghostly form to possess enemies to try to hamper the main player's progress in the game. The idea being that if player 2 could defeat Banjo, they'd actually swap roles. It sounds interesting, but ultimately it was cut due to debugging issues, despite the studio saying it worked very well. But back to the story, and no surprise is that the gang vow to make the sinister trio pay for what they've just done, and so begins another adventure in the action-packed world in which the characters live. As far as storylines go, I think this is a perfect setup. It honours the previous game whilst quickly giving you a larger cast of nasties to deal with, as well as killing off one of the most beloved characters from the first game to give you an incentive to actually want to beat them. The feature list this time around includes 8 giant worlds to explore, tons of new moves and transformations to unlock, as well as having a huge story to contend with, there's also a multiplayer mode to get stuck into. Technically speaking, the game also offers enhanced widescreen as an option without the need for the expansion pack, Dolby surround sound support, and for those that like to feel the action, you can also slap in a rumble pack. Jumping into the adventure, you'll quickly realise that although the game feels familiar, the sheer scope of the game is unlike anything since Ocarina of Time. Like the first game, you'll need to collect jiggies, which are the game's core currency. Collecting those will allow you to attempt the Jiggy Master's puzzle, which when completed will open up a new world. Musical notes this time around, however, are used to unlock new moves, in addition to the core moves contained from the previous game. Whilst many of the core moves do remain intact, there is a whole host of new ones to learn. One of the biggest new additions is the ability to separate Banjo and Kazooie at various points in the game. Whereas the first title had Kazooie stuffed in your backpack for the majority, this time she is allowed to develop much more as a sole core gameplay character rather than just a mere sidekick to Banjo's antics. 
This mechanic is also a stroke of genius, as with each character also having their own individual moves, you'll need to think about how to get a Jiggy as either the duo or as their own individual forms. It's not only Banjo and Kazooie that you'll get to take control of this time, however. Everyone's favourite shaman, Mumbo Jumbo, also becomes a playable character. And with his awesome spells at your disposal, you'll be getting a lot more creative in your puzzle solving than you'd expect. Add to this Humba Wumba, the Native American who sits in her wigwam, awaiting to transform Banjo and Kazooie into various new forms using her magical pool. These transformations, like the first game, open up even more creative ways for you to collect jiggies and progress through the quest. As you can probably tell so far, one of the biggest improvements over the first title is just how much more depth there is in the collection department. Whereas Donkey Kong 64 became an almost over-the-top collectathon, Banjo 2 is much smarter with its collecting mechanic. The eight worlds are all interconnected and form a larger overworld map. For example, in the first game you'd be jumping into treasure chests and disappearing down pipes to suddenly appear in the new world, whereas in Banjo-Tooie everything flows from one environment to the next. This can be both a pro and a con dependent on how you look at it. The level style variation isn't as diverse as the first title, which saw you enter the usual platform game world tropes. In Banjo-Tooie, however, each world feels more of a progressive continuation of the art style rather than something completely new. This is not a bad thing in my opinion, however it can take away some of the enjoyment of unlocking a new world to find it's not quite as fresh feeling as expected. The game also has a much more packed boss battle department, and I love the variation involved in tackling each of them. It's not only about learning their patterns, but it's also about thinking how to defeat them using the many skills and abilities you've unlocked. They are bursting with character, and although some of the bosses return for some rematches, they rarely become tiresome. The only negative is that some are incredibly easy, and you'll take them down the first time you play them with no trouble at all, whereas some of the bosses can leave you close to rage after they've defeated you for the umpteenth time. With worlds such as Grunty's Industries, Hellfire Peaks, Cauldron Keep and Witchy World, you'll get the sense that this isn't quite as light-hearted as Banjo-Kazooie was with a much more adult tone in the game which spills into the game's writing. If you're a fan of the British style humour found in many classic rare games, then you will be right at home here. There's a huge amount of well-written, sarcastic humour and plenty of adult innuendos included. This will blow over the heads of younger gamers, but for anyone with a keen ear, you'll be smirking at many points in the game. And speaking of your ears, this game really is a treat to listen to. The same gibberish character speak is included and so if you found it annoying in the first game, you won't enjoy this, but most of us find it an almost warm feeling from hearing your favourite characters chat amongst one another one more time. The effects are also crisp and clear and naturally with Dolby support, the effects help to make the worlds feel alive and rich with sound. The music in the game is also a return to the classic rare charm, and although I personally prefer Banjo-Kazooie's jingles from a nostalgic perspective, it's hard not to enjoy Tui's. You'll be pleased to know that the same transitional background music in the first game is actually back here for a second run. This time around though it's even more dynamic, and with Grant Kirkhope having twice as much memory space than the first game, it quickly becomes noticeable as he was able to combine two MIDI files to channel the audio during transitions. Whilst the audio is technically near perfect, the game's visuals are perhaps the game's biggest issue. Now graphically the visuals are spectacular, with long draw distances, huge open environments and plenty of texture quality to boot, it's certainly one of the best looking games on the console from an art style perspective. Whereas Banjo-Kazooie slowly drew in texture quality and polygons as you advance towards them, everything in Banjo-Tooie is sharp from the get-go. The real-time lighting gives the game an almost cartoon-like quality, and even multiple light sources in the game will work together independently in real time to produce some awesome looking shadows. The particle effects too, be it from magic, water or fire, look fantastic, and this is combined with much higher character model animation levels. As a third generation N64 game, you can certainly see that by this time Rare felt that they had perfectly locked down their abilities to push the console to its limits. Sadly, pushing the visuals to these types of limits does come at a cost. As surprising as it may be, the frame rate can at times be an absolute mess. 
Now I'd love to say that it doesn't become noticeable, but sadly, there are many times in the game where it becomes painfully obvious the console is struggling. Whilst the majority of the game ticks along at a steady 15 frames per second, there will be moments where it feels like it's dropped to around 5. Then moments later, for example when you go into the first person shooter mode, it seems to whip along at 60 frames a second as if they've stuck the perfect dark engine into the game. The saving grace is that the game is just so enjoyable that you'll hopefully be able to overlook it. Thankfully, the game is made by Rare, and although I'm showing some developer bias here, if it was pretty much any other studio, it would feel like a bigger deal. Whilst Banjo-Kazooie offered a near-perfect solo experience, Banjo-Tooie wanted to expand on this and get the multiplayer mode they had scrapped from the first game. It does give the game further replayability, but this will depend on who you're playing with and if they'd rather play the more popular N64 multiplayer games. Banjo-Tooie does have a good mix of mini-games designed to be played with friends, and the mix includes deathmatches and other fairground-style events such as dodgems. I personally feel that the game could have done without these, however as they are extracted from the main single-player story mode, it's easy to see why this was included, as it wouldn't have taken much effort to package together. I wouldn't be in a hurry to play this with your friends with so many better options on the console, but you may be able to get an hour or two enjoyment from it. Upon its release, Banjo-Tooie received critical acclaim and it became a commercial success for the studio. Across the board, reviewers were ranking the game incredibly highly, and a key area that they loved was how much content was in the game and that the insane amount of collecting from Donkey Kong 64 had been reined back to create a more constructive gameplay experience. With the console being so packed full of platform games, I personally find it hard to choose which is my favourite. For many people, the reason why this may not top their lists, and I would include myself in this group here, is the fact that this was a later N64 title, it just didn't have the same amount of nostalgia when I revisited it. I know the game is technically superior to Banjo-Kazooie, however, the only way I can explain it is that playing Banjo-Kazooie these days is like visiting a long-lost friend that you've known since your childhood. But playing Banjo-Tooie is like bumping into someone that you used to know but haven't kept in touch with. And although you don't remember why, you just don't care about them the same way. If you have no nostalgia for either title, or if you can actually put your own personal feelings aside, you will no doubt find that Banjo-Tooie is one heck of a title to play. With great visuals, huge open worlds and tight controls which make it a delight to play, you'd be hard pushed to find a platform game which gives you so much bang for your buck. These days, the game is becoming more and more expensive, and I feel that may be due to many gamers having previously left the console by this time, and ultimately returning now to the franchise to check out on what they missed. As much as it pains me to say this, however, you may be better playing the Xbox re-release, which features slightly bumped up visuals and resolution, as well as the infamous stop and swap feature which has been put back into the game. For me, this will be one of the most interesting discussions in the comments section, because I'd love to know what you make of Banjo-Tooie. Did you eagerly pick this game back up in the day after having loved Banjo-Kazooie like I did, or did you pick this up title recently to add to your collection and revisiting this classic game? I'm not forgetting modern gamers here either, because I'd especially love to hear from anyone who first played this title on the Xbox, and whether or not you found this platforming action to be dated even by that time. So as always, let me know your thoughts, feelings, memories and opinions in the comments section down below, and until next time.